open. Start in a couple minutes. I need to look up a word. We'll give it another 30 seconds, then we'll get started. Yesterday, we started with book one of the tale of Despero, book the first, A Mouse is Born. Today, we are starting on book the second, Chiaroscuro. I looked at the pronunciation so that I could do it right. Chapter 16, Blinded by the Light. As our story continues, we must go backward in time to the birth of a rat, a rat named Chiaroscuro and called Roscuro. A rat born into the filth and darkness of the dungeon, several years before the mouse Despero was born upstairs in the light. Do you know the definition of the word chiaroscuro? If you look on your dictionary, you will find that it means the arrangement of light and dark, darkness and light together. Rats do not care for light. Roscuro's parents were having a bit of fun when they named their son. Rats have a sense of humor. Rats, in fact, think that life is very funny, and they are right. They are right. In the case of Chiaroscuro, however, the joke had a hint of prophecy to it, for it happened that when Roscuro was a very young rat, he came upon a great length of rope on the dungeon floor. Ah, what have we here? said Roscuro. Being a rat, he immediately began to nibble at the rope. Stop that, boomed a voice, and a great hand came out of the darkness and picked up the rat by his tail and held him suspended upside down. Were you nibbling on Gregory's rope, rat? Who wants to know? said Roscuro, for even upside down, he was still a rat. You smart alecky rat, you smart alecky rat, nib, nib, nibbling on Gregory's rope. Gregory will teach you to mess with his rope. And keeping Roscuro upside down, Gregory lit a match with the nail of his thumb, and then held the brilliant flame right in Roscuro's face. Ah! said Roscuro. He pulled his head back away from the light, but alas, he did not close his eyes, and the flame exploded around him and danced inside him. Has no one told you the rules? said Gregory. What rules? Gregory's rope, rat, is off limits. So? Apologize for chewing on Gregory's rope. I will not, said Roscuro. Apologize. No. Filthy rat, said Gregory. You black-souled thing, Gregory's had it with you rats. He held the match closer to Roscuro's face, and a terrible smell of burnt whiskers rose up around the jailer and the rat. And then the match went out, and Gregory released Roscuro's tail. He flung him back in the darkness. Do not ever touch Gregory's rope again, or you will be sorry. Roscuro sat on the dungeon floor. The whiskers on the left side of his face were gone. His heart was beating hard. And though the light from the match had disappeared, it danced still before the rat's eyes, even when he closed them. Light, he said aloud, and then he whispered the word again. Light. From that moment forward, 
Roscuro showed an abnormal, inordinate interest in illumination of all, of all sorts, and all shorts. Illuminated shorts would be quite something. He was always, in the darkness of the dungeon, on the lookout for light, the smallest glibber, the tidiest shibber. His rat soul longed inexplicably for it. He began to think that light was the only thing that gave life meaning, and he despaired that there was so little of it to be had. He finally voiced this sentiment to his friend, a very old one-eared rat named Botticelli Remorso. I think, said Roscuro, that the meaning of life is light. Light, said Botticelli. Aha, you kill me. Light has nothing to do with it. What does it mean, then, said Roscuro. The meaning of life, said Botticelli, is suffering, specifically the suffering of others. Prisoners, for instance, reducing a prisoner to weeping and wailing and begging is a delightful way to invest your existence with meaning. As he spoke, Botticelli swung from the one extraordinarily long nail of his right front paw a heart-shaped locket. Hmm. He had taken the locket from a prisoner and hung it on a thin braided rope. Whenever Botticelli spoke, the locket moved. Back and forth, back and forth it swung. Are you listening? Botticelli said to Roscuro. I'm listening. Good, said Botticelli. Do as I say and your life will be full of meaning. This is how to torture a prisoner. First, you must convince him that you are a friend. Listen to him. Encourage him to confess his sins. And when the time is right, talk to him. Tell him what he wants to hear. Tell him, for instance, that you will forgive him. This is a wonderful joke to play upon a prisoner, to promise forgiveness. Why? said Roscuro. His eyes went back and forth, back and forth, following the locket. Because, said Botticelli, you will promise it. Ha! But you will not grant it. You gain his trust, and then you deny him. You refuse to offer the very thing he wants. Forgiveness, freedom, friendship, whatever it is that his heart most desires, you withhold. At this point in his lecture, Botticelli laughed so hard that he had to sit down and catch his breath. The locket swayed slowly back and forth, and then stopped altogether. Ha, said Botticelli. Ha, 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 you gain his trust. You refuse him, and <laughs> you become what he knew you were all along. What you knew you were all along. Not a friend, not a confessor, not a forgiver, but <laughs> a rat. Botticelli wiped his eyes and shook his head and sighed a sigh of great contentment. He set the locket in motion again. But at that point, it is most effective to run back and forth over the prisoner's feet, inducing physical terror along with the emotional sort. Oh, he said, it is such a lovely game, such a lovely game, and it is just absolutely chock full of meaning. I would like very much to torture a prisoner, said Roscuro. I would like to make someone suffer. Your time will come, said Botticelli. Currently, all the prisoners are spoken for. But another prisoner will arrive sooner or later. How do I know this to be true? Because, Roscuro, thankfully, there is evil in the world. And the presence of evil guarantees the existence of prisoners. So soon there'll be a prisoner for me. Yes, said Botticelli Remorso. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> of course you are looking forward to it. You are looking forward to it because you are a rat, a real rat. Yes, said Roscuro, I'm a real rat. Concerned not at all with delight, said Botticelli. Concerned not at all with delight, repeated Roscuro. Botticelli laughed again and shook his head. The locket, suspended from the long nail on his paw, swung back and forth, back and forth. You, my young friend, are a rat. Exactly, yes. Evil, prisoners, rats, suffering. It all fits together so neatly, so sweetly. Oh, it is a lovely world. A lovely, dark world. Chapter 17. Small Comforts. Not long after this conversation between Botticelli and Roscuro, a prisoner did arrive. The dungeon door slammed, and the two rats watched a man being led by a king's soldier. <sighs> 
down the stairs into the dungeon. Excellent, whispered Botticelli. This one is yours. Mascuro looked at the man closely. I will make him suffer, he said. But as he stared up at the man, the door to the dungeon was suddenly flung open, and a thick and brilliant shaft of afternoon light cut into the dark of the dungeon. Ugh, said Botticelli. He covered his eyes with one paw. Roscuro, however, stared directly into the light. This is important. The rat called Chiaroscuro did not look away. He let the light from the upstairs world enter him and filled him. He gasped aloud with the wonder of it. Give him his small comforts, shouted a voice at the top of the stairs, and a red cloth was thrown into the light. The cloth hung suspended for a moment, bright red and glowing, and then the door was slammed shut again and the light disappeared and the cloth fell to the floor. It was Gregory the jailer who bent to pick it up. Go on, said the old man as he held out the cloth to the prisoner. Take it. You'll need every last bit of warmth down here. And so the prisoner took the cloth and draped it around his shoulders as if it were a cloak, and the soldier of the king said, Right then, Gregory, he's all yours. And the soldier turned and went back up the steps and opened the door to the outside world and some small light leaked in before he closed the door behind him. This is interesting. <laughs> There's a, an image of Roscuro staring into the light and uh, Botticelli covering his eyes in, and flinching away. Did you see that? Roscuro said to Botticelli. Hideously ugly, said Botticelli. Ridiculous. What can they possibly mean by letting all that light in at once? Don't they know this is a dungeon? It was beautiful, said Roscuro. No, said Botticelli. No, he looked at Roscuro intently. Not beautiful, no. I must see more light. I must see all of it, said Roscuro. I must go upstairs. Botticelli sighed. Who cares about the light? Your obsession with it is tiresome. Listen, we are rats. Rats. We do not like light. We are about the darkness. We are about suffering. But, said Roscuro, upstairs. No buts, said Botticelli. No buts, none. Rats do not go upstairs. Upstairs is the domain of mice. He took the locket from around his neck. What, he said, swinging it back and forth, is this rope made of? Whiskers. The whiskers of whom? Mice. Exactly. And who lives upstairs? Mice. Exactly. Mice. Botticelli turned his head and spat on the floor. Mice are nothing but little packages of blood and bones, afraid of everything. They are despicable, laughable, the opposite of everything we strive to be. Do you want to live in their world? Roscuro looked up, past Botticelli, to the delicious sliver of light that shone out from underneath the door. He said nothing. Listen, said Botticelli, this is what you shall do. Go and torture the prisoner. Go and take the red cloth from him. The cloth will satisfy your cravings for something from the other world, but do not go up into the light. You will regret it. As he spoke, the locket swung back and forth, back and forth. You do not belong in that world. You are a rat, a rat. Say it with me. A rat, said Crescuro. Ah, but you are cheating. You must say, I am a rat, said Botticelli, smiling his slow smile at Roscuro. I am a rat, said Roscuro. Again, said Botticelli, swinging his locket. I am a rat. Exactly, said Botticelli. A rat is a rat is a rat. End of story, world without end. Amen. Yes, said Roscuro. Amen, I am a rat. He closed his eyes. He saw again the red cloth spinning against the backdrop of gold. And he told himself, reader, that it was the cloth that he desired and not the light. Chapter 18, Confessions. Roscuro went, as Botticelli told him he must, to torment the new prisoner and to take the red cloth from him. The man was sitting with his legs stretched out straight in front of him, chained to the floor. The red cloth was still draped over his shoulders. Roscuro squeezed through the bars and crept crept slowly over the damp, weeping stones of the cell floor. (sighs) 
when he was close to the man, he said, Ah, welcome, welcome. We are delighted to have you. The man lit a match and looked at Roscuro. Roscuro stared longingly into the light. Go on, said the prisoner. He waved a hand in the direction of Roscuro, and the match went out. The match went out. You're nothing but a rat. I am, said Roscuro. Exactly that, a rat. Allow me to congratulate you on your very astute powers of observation. What do you want, rat? What do I want? Nothing. Nothing for my sake, that is. I have come for you. I have come to keep you company here in the dark. He crawled closer to the man. I don't need the company of a rat. What about the solace a sympathetic ear can provide? Do you need that? Huh? Would you like to confess your sins? To a rat? You're kidding, you are. Come now, said Riscuo. Close your eyes. Pretend that I'm not a rat. Pretend that I'm nothing but a voice in the darkness. A voice that cares. The prisoner closed his eyes. All right, he said. I'll tell you. But I'm telling you because there ain't no point in not telling you. No point in keeping secrets from a dirty little rat. I ain't in such a desperate way that I need to lie to a rat. The man cleared his throat. I'm here for stealing six cows, two jerseys and four guernseys. Cow theft, that's my crime. He opened his eyes and stared into the darkness. He laughed. He closed his eyes again. But there's something else I'd done many years ago. Another crime and they don't even know of it. Go on, said Roscuro softly. He crept closer. He allowed one paw to touch the magical red cloth. I traded my girl, my young daughter, for this red tablecloth and for a hen and for a handful of cigarettes. Tisk, said Roscuro. He was not alarmed to hear such a hideous thing. His parents, after all, had not much cared for him, and certainly if there was any profit in it, they would have sold him. And then, too, Botticelli Remorso, one lazy Sunday afternoon, had recited from memory all the confessions he had heard from prisoners. What humans were capable of came as no surprise to Roscuro. And then, said the man, and then, encouraged Roscuro, and then I'd done the worst thing of all. I walked away from her and she was crying and calling out for me, but I did not even look back. I did not. Oh, Lord, I kept walking. The prisoner cleared his throat. He sniffed. Ah, said Riscuro. Yes, I see. By now, he was standing so that all four of his paws were touching the red cloth. Did you find comfort in this cloth that you sold your child for? It's warm, said the man. Was it worth your child? I like the colour of it. Does the cloth remind you of what you've done wrong? It does, the prisoner said. He sniffed. It does. Allow me to ease your burden, said Roscuro. He stood on his hind legs and bowed at the waist. I will take this reminder of your sin from you, he said. The rat took hold of the tablecloth in his strong teeth and pulled it off the shoulders of the man. Hey, see here, I want that back. But Roscuro, reader, was quick. He pulled the tablecloth through the bars of the cell, whoosh, like a magic trick in reverse. Hey, shouted the prisoner, bring that back, it's all I got. Yes, said Roscuro, and that is exactly why I must have it. You dirty rat, shouted the prisoner. Yes, said Roscuro, that is right, that is most accurate. And he left the man and dragged the tablecloth back to his nest and considered it. What a disappointment it was. Looking at it, Roscuro knew that Botticelli was wrong. What Roscuro wanted, what he needed, was not the cloth, but the light that had shone behind it. He wanted to be filled, flooded, blinded again with light. And for that reader, the rat knew he must go upstairs. Chapter 19. Light, light everywhere. Imagine, if you will, having spent the whole of your life in a dungeon. Imagine that late one spring day, you step out of the dark and into a world of bright windows and polished floors, winking copper pots, shining suits of armor, and tapestries sewn in gold. Imagine, and while you are imagining things, imagine this too. Imagine that at the same time the rat steps from the dungeon and into the castle, a mouse is being born upstairs, a mouse reader who is destined to meet the light bedazzled rat. But that meeting will occur much later, and for now the rat is nothing but happy, delighted, is nothing but happy, delighted, amazed to find himself standing in so much light. I, said Roscuro, spinning dizzily from one bright thing to the next, 
I will never leave. No, never. I will never go back to the dungeon. Why would I? I will never talk to another prisoner. It is here that I belong. The rat waltzed happily from room to room until he found himself at the door to the banquet hall. He looked inside and saw gathered there King Philip, Queen Rosemary, the Princess P, twenty noble people, a juggler, four minstrels, and all the king's men. This party reader was a sight for a rat's eyes. Mascuro had never seen happy people. He had known only the miserable ones. Gregory the jailer and those who were consigned to his domain did not laugh or smile or clink glasses with the person sitting next to them. Mascuro was enchanted. Everything glittered, everything. The gold spoons on the table and the jingle bells on the juggler's cap, the strings on the minstrel's guitars and the crowns on the king's and the queen's heads. And the little princess, how lovely she was. How much like light itself. Her gown was covered in sequins that winked and glimmered at the rat. And when she laughed, and she laughed often, everything around her seemed to glow brighter. Oh, really, said Roscura. This is too extraordinary. This is too wonderful. I must tell Botticelli that he was wrong. Suffering is not the answer. Light is the answer. And he made his way into the banquet hall. He lifted his tail off the ground and held it an angle and marched in time to the music the minstrels were playing on the guitars. The rat reader invited, <laughs> invited himself to the party. Chapter 20. A view from a chandelier. There was in the banquet hall a most beautiful and ornate chandelier. The crystals that hung from it caught the light of the candles on the table and the light from the face of the laughing princess. They danced to the rhythm of the minstrel's music, swaying back and forth, twinkling and beckoning. What better place to view all this glory, all this beauty? There was so much laughing and singing and juggling that no one noticed as Rescuro crawled up a table leg and onto the table, and from there flung himself onto the lowest branch of the chandelier. Hanging by one paw, he swung back and forth, admiring the spectacle below him. The smells of the food, the sound of the music, and the light, the light, the light. Amazing, unbelievable. Rescuro smiled and shook his head. Unfortunately, a rat can hang from a chandelier for only so long before he is discovered. This would be true with even the loudest party. Reader, do you know who it was that spotted him? You are absolutely right. The sharp-eyed Princess P. A rat, she shouted. A rat is hanging from the chandelier. The party, as I have noted, was loud. The minstrels were strumming and singing. The people were laughing and eating. The man with the jingle cap was juggling and jingling. No one in the midst of all this merriment heard the pee. No one except for Roscuro. Rat. He had never been a before aware of what an ugly word it was. Rat. In the middle of all that beauty, it immediately, be immediately became clear that it was an extremely distasteful syllable. Rat. A curse, an insult, a word totally without light. And not until he heard it from the mouth of the princess did Rescuro realize that he did not like being a rat, that he did not want to be a rat. This revelation hit Rescuro with such force that it made him lose his grip on the chandelier. The rat reader fell, and alas, he fell right directly into the queen's bowl of soup. Chapter 21. The queen loved soup. She loved soup more than anything in the world, except for the Princess P, the king. And because the queen loved it, soup was served in the castle for every banquet, every lunch, and every dinner. And what soup it was! Cook's love and admiration for the queen and her palate moved the broth that she concocted from the level of mere food to a high art. On this particular day, for this particular banquet, Cook had outdone herself. The soup was a masterwork, a delicate mingling of chicken, watercress, and garlic. Rescuro, as he surfaced from the bottom of the queen's capacious bowl, could not help taking a few appreciative sips. Lovely, he said, distracted for a moment from the mis misery of his existence. Delightful. See, shouted the pea. See, she stood. She pointed her finger right at Rescuro. It is a rat. I told you that it was a rat. He was hanging from the chandelier, and now he is in Mama's soup. The musicians stopped playing their guitars. The jugglers stopped juggling the noble people stopped eating. The queen looked at Roscuro. Roscuro looked at the queen. Reader, in the spirit of honesty, 
I must utter a difficult and unsavory truth. Rats are not beautiful creatures. They are not even cute. They are really rather nasty beats, beasts, and beats. Particularly if one happens to appear in your bowl of soup with pieces of watercress clinging to his whiskers. There was a long moment of silence, and then Rescuro said to the queen, I beg your pardon. In response, the queen flung her spoon in the air and made an incredible noise, a noise that was in no way worthy of a queen, a noise somewhere between the neigh of a horse and the squeal of a pig, a noise that sounded something like this, Nying! And then she said, There is a rat in my soup. The queen was really a simple soul, and always her whole life had done nothing except state the overly obvious. She died as she lived. There was a rat in my soup were the last words she uttered. She clutched her chest and fell over backwards. Her royal chair hit the floor with a thump, and the banquet hall exploded. Spoons were dropped. Chairs were flung back. Save her, thundered the king. You must save her. All the king's men ran to try and rescue the queen. Rescuro climbed out of the bowl of soup. He felt that under the circumstances, it would be best if he left. As he crawled across the tablecloth, he remembered the words of the prisoner in the dungeon, his regret that he did not look back at his daughter as he left her. And so Rescuro turned. He looked back, and he saw that the princess was glaring at him. Her eyes were filled with disgust and anger. Go back to the dungeon, was what the look she gave him said. Go back into the darkness where you belong. This look, reader, broke Rescuro's heart. Did you think that rats do not have hearts? Wrong. All living things have a heart, and the heart of any living thing can be broken. If the rat had not looked over his shoulder, perhaps his heart would not have broken, and it is possible then that I would not have a story to tell. But reader, he did look. Chapter 22. He puts his heart together again. Rescuro hurried from the banquet hall. A rat, he said. He put a paw over his heart. I'm a rat, and there's no light for rats. There will be no light for me. The king's men were still bent over the queen. The king was still shouting, save her, save her. And the queen was still dead, of course, when Rescuro encountered the queen's royal soup spoon lying on the floor. I will have something beautiful, he said aloud. I am a rat, but I will have something beautiful. I will have a crown of my own. He picked up the spoon. He put it on his head. And here he is with the spoon upon his head. Yes, said Rescuro. I will have something beautiful and I will have revenge. Both things, somehow. There are those hearts that never mend again once they are broken. Or if they do mend, they heal themselves in a crooked and lopsided way, as if sewn together by a careless craftsman. Such was the fate of Chiaroscuro. His heart was broken. Picking up the spoon and placing it on his head, speaking of revenge, these things helped him to put his heart together again, but it was, alas, put together wrong. Where is the king? Where is the rat? shouted the king. Find that rat! If you want me, muttered Rescuro as he left the banquet hall, I will be in the dungeon, in the darkness. Chapter 23, Consequences. There were, of course, dire consequences of Rescuro's behavior. Every action, reader, no matter how small, has a consequence. For instance, the young Rescuro gnawed on Gregory the jailer's rope. And because he gnawed on the rope, a match was lit in his face. And because a match was lit in his face, his soul was set afire. The rat's soul was set afire, and because of this, he journeyed upstairs seeking the light. Upstairs in the banquet hall, the Princess P spotted him and called out the word rat. And because of this, Rescuro fell into the queen's soup. And because the rat fell into the queen's soup, the queen died. You can see, can't you, how everything is related to everything else. You can see quite clearly how every action has a consequence. For instance, if, reader, you will indulge me and allow me to continue this meditation on consequences, because the queen died while eating soup, the heartbroken king outlawed soup. And because soup was outlawed, so were all the instruments involved in the making and eating of soup. Spoons and bowls and kettles. These things were collected from all the people in the kingdom of Dor, and they were piled in the dungeon. And because Rescuro was dazzled by the light of one match and journeyed upstairs and fell into the queen's soup and the queen died, the king ordered the death of every rat in the land. The king's men went bravely into the dungeon to kill the rats. 
But the thing about killing a rat is that you must first find a rat. And if a rat does not want to be found, reader, he will not be found. The king's men succeeded only in getting lost in the dungeon's torturous mazes. Some of them, in fact, did not ever find their way out again and died there in the dark heart of the castle. And so the killing of all rats was not successful. And in desperation, King Philip declared that rats were illegal. He declared them outlaws. This, of course, was a ridiculous law, as rats are outlaws to begin with. How can you outlaw an outlaw? It is a waste of time and energy. But still, the king officially decreed that all rats in the kingdom of Dor were outlaws and should be treated as such. When you are a king, you may make as many ridiculous laws as you like. That is what being a king is all about. But reader, we must not forget that King Philip loved the queen, and that without her he was lost. That's the danger of loving. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how many kingdoms you rule, you cannot stop those you love from dying. Making soup illegal, outlawing rats, these things soothe the poor king's heart, and so we must forgive him. And what of the outlawed rats? What of one outlawed rat in particular? What of Chiaroscuro? In the darkness of the dungeon, he sat in his nest with the spoon atop his head. He set to work fashioning for himself a kingly cape he made out of a scrap of the red tablecloth. And as he worked, old one-eared Botticelli Remorso sat next to him, swinging his locket back and forth, back and forth, saying, You see what comes from a rat going upstairs. I hope that you have learned your lesson. Your job in this world is to make others suffer. Yes, muttered Rescue. Yes, that is exactly what I intend to do. I will make the princess suffer for how she looked at me. And as Rescuro worked and planned, the jailer Gregory held tight to his rope and made his own way through the darkness. And in a dank cell, the prisoner who had once had a red tablecloth and now had nothing, spent his days and nights weeping quietly. High above the dungeon, upstairs, in the castle, a small mouse stood alone one evening as his brothers and sisters sniffed for crumbs. He stood with his head cocked to one side, listening to a sweet sound he did not yet have a name for. There would be consequences of the consequences of the mouse's love for music. You, reader, already know some of these consequences. Because of the music, the mouse would find his way to a princess. He would fall in love. And speaking of consequences, the same evening that Despero stood inside the castle, hearing music for the first time, outside the castle, in the, in the gloom of dusk, more consequences drew near. A wagon driven by a king's soldier, and piled high with spoons and bowls and kettles, was making its way to the castle, and beside the soldier there sat a young girl with ears that looked like nothing so much as pieces of cauliflower stuck on either side of her head. The girl's name, reader, was Migri Sow, and though she did not yet know it, she would be instrumental in helping the rat work his revenge. End of the second book. We're only half an hour in today, so we'll keep on going for a while. Book the third. Go! The Tale of Miggery Sow. Chapter 24. A handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Again, reader, we must go backward before we can go forward. With that said, here begins a short history of the life and times of Miggery Sow, a girl born into this world many years before the mouse Despero and the rat Chiaroscuro, a girl born far from the castle, a girl named for his for her father's favorite prize-winning pig. Miggery Sow was six years old when her mother, holding on to Mig's hand and staring directly into Mig's eyes, died. Ma, said Mig, Ma, couldn't you stay here with me? Oh, said her mother, who is that? Who is that holding my hand? It's me, Ma, Miggery Sow. Ah, oh, child, let me go. But I want you to stay here, said Miggery, wiping first at her runny nose and then at her runny eyes. You want, said her, said her mother. Yes, said Mig, I want. Ah, oh, child, and what does it matter what you are wanting, said her mother. She squeezed Mig's hand once, twice, and then she died leaving Mig alone with her father, who on a market day in spring, soon after his wife's death, sold his daughter into service for a handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Papa, said Mig, when her father was walking away from her with the hen in his arms, a cigarette in his mouth, and the red tablecloth draped across his shoulders like a cape. 
Go on, Mig, he said. You belong to that man now. But I don't want to, Papa, she said. I want to go with you. She took hold of the red tablecloth and tugged on it. Lord child, her father said, and who is asking you what you want? Go on now. He untangled her fingers from the cloth and turned her in the direction of the man who had bought her. Meg watched her father walk away, the red tablecloth billowing out behind him. He left his daughter, and reader, as you already know, he did not look back, not even once. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine your father selling you for a tablecloth, a hen, and a handful of cigarettes? Close your eyes, please, and consider it for just a moment. Done? I hope that the hair on the back of your neck stood up as you thought of Mig's fate and how it would be if it were your own. Poor Mig. What will become of her? You must, frightened though you may be, read on and see for yourself. Reader, it is your duty. Chapter 25. A Vicious Circle. Miggery Sow called the man who had purchased her uncle, as he said she must. And also as he said she must, Meg tended uncle's sheep and cooked uncle's food and scrubbed uncle's kettle. She did all of this without a word of thanks or praise from the man himself. Another unfortunate fact of life with uncle was that he very much liked giving Meg what he referred to as a good clock to the year. In fairness to uncle, it must be reported that he always did inquire whether or not Meg was interested in receiving the clout. Their daily exchanges went something like this. Uncle, I thought I told you to clean the kettle. Mig, I cleaned it, Uncle. I cleaned it good. Uncle, oh, it's filthy. You will have to be punished, won't you? Mig, go, Uncle. I cleaned the kettle. Uncle, are you saying I'm a liar, girl? Mig, no, Uncle. Uncle, do you want a good clout to the ear, then? Mig, no, thank you, Uncle. I don't. Alas, Uncle seemed to be entirely unconcerned with what Mig wanted, as her father and mother had been. The disgust clout to the ear was always delivered. Delivered, I'm afraid, with a great deal of enthusiasm on Uncle's part, and received with absolutely no enthusiasm at all on the part of Mig. These clouts were alarmingly frequent, and Uncle was scrupulously fair in paying attention to both the right and left side of Migri Sal. So it was that after a time, the young Mig's ears came to resemble not so much ears, as pieces of cauliflower stuck to either side of her head, and they became about as useful to her as pieces of cauliflower. That is to say that they all but ceased their functioning as ears. Words for Mig lost their sharp edges, and then they lost their edges altogether and became blurry, blankety things that she had a great deal of trouble making any sense of out of, sense out of at all. The less Mig heard, the less she understood. The less she understood, the more things she did wrong, and the more things she did wrong, the more clouts to the ear she received, and the less she heard. This is what is known as a vicious circle, and Migri Sa was right in the center of it, which is not, reader, where anybody would want to be. But then, as you know, what Migri Sa wanted had never been of much concern to anyone. Chapter 26. When Mig turned seven years old, there was no cake, no celebration, no singing, no present, no acknowledgement of her birthday at all, other than Mig saying, Uncle, today I'm seven years old. And Uncle saying in return, Did I ask you how old you were today? Get out of my face before I give you a good cloak to the ear. A few hours after receiving her birthday cloak to the ear, Mig was out in the field with Uncle Sheep when she saw something glittering and glowing on the horizon. She thought for a moment that it was the sun. But she turned and saw that the sun was in the west, where it should be, sinking to join the earth. This thing that shone so brightly was something else. Mig stood in the field and shaded her eyes with her left hand and watched the brilliant light draw closer and closer and closer until it revealed itself to be King Philip and his queen Rosemary and their daughter, the young Princess P. The royal family was surrounded by knights in shining armour and horses in shining armour, and atop each member of the royal family's head, there was a golden crown. And they were all, the king and the queen and the princess, dressed in robes decorated with jewels and sequins that glittered and glowed and captured the light of the setting sun and reflected it back. Go, breathed Mig. The princess P was riding on a white horse that picked up its legs very high and set them down very daintily. The P saw Mig standing and staring, and she raised a hand to her. Hello, the Princess P called out merrily. Hello, and she waved her hand again. Mig did not wave back. Instead, she stood and watched, open-mouthed, as the perfect, beautiful family passed her by. Papa, 
So called the princess to the king. What is wrong with the girl? She will not wave to me. Never mind, said the king. It is of no consequence, my dear. But I'm a princess, and I waved to her. She should wave back. Mig, for her part, continued to stare. Looking at the royal family had awakened some deep and slumbering need in her. It was if, as if a small candle had been lit in her interior, sparked to life by the brilliance of the king and the queen and the princess. For the first time in her life, reader, Mig hoped. And hope is like love, a ridiculous, wonderful, powerful thing. Mig tried to name this strange emotion. She put a hand up to touch one of her aching ears, and she realized that the feeling she was experiencing, the hope blooming inside of her, felt exactly the opposite of a good clout. She smiled and took her hand away from her ear. She waved to the princess. Today is my birthday, Mig called out. But the king and the queen and the princess were by now too far away to hear her. Today, shouted Mig, I'm seven years old. That night, in the small dark hut that she shared with Uncle and the sheep, Mig tried to speak of what she had seen. Uncle, she said, Hey, I saw some human stars today. How was that? I saw them all glittering and glowing, and there was a little princess wearing her own crown and riding on a little white tippy-toed horse. What are you going on about? said Uncle. I saw a king and a queen and an itty-bitty princess, shouted Mig. So? shouted Uncle Beck. I would like, said Mig shyly, I wish to be one of them princesses. Ha! Oh, laughed Uncle. Laughed Uncle. Ha! Oh, and a big dumb thing like you, you ain't even worth the enormous lot I paid for you. Don't I wish every night that I had back that good hen and that red tablecloth in place of you. He did not wait for Mig to guess the correct answer to this question. I do, he said. I wish it every night. That tablecloth was the colour of blood. That hen could lay eggs like nobody's business. I want to be a princess, said Mig. I want to wear a crown. A crown, Uncle laughed. She wants to wear a crown, he laughed harder. He took the empty kettle and put it on top of his head. Look at me, he said. I'm a king. See my crown? I'm a king just like I always wanted to be. I'm a king because I want to be one. He danced around the hut with the kettle on his head. He laughed until he cried, and then he stopped dancing and took the kettle from his head and looked at Mig and said, Do you want a good clout to the air for such nonsense? No, thank you, Uncle, said Mig, but she got one anyway. Look here, said Uncle after the clout had been delivered. We will hear no more talk of princesses. Besides, whoever asked you what you wanted in this world, girl? The answer to that question, reader, as you already well know, was absolutely no one. Chapter 28 to the castle. Years passed. Mig spent them scrubbing the kettle and tending the sheep and cleaning the hut and collecting innumerable, uncountable, extremely painful clouts to the air. In the evening, spring or winter, summer or fall, Mig stood in the field as the sun set, hoping that the royal family would pass before her again. Go, oh, I would like to see that little princess another time, wouldn't I? And a little pony too with his tippy-toed feet. This hope, this wish, that she would see the princess again was lodged deep in Mig's heart. Lodged firmly right next to it was the hope that she, Miggery Sow, could someday become a princess herself. The first of Mig's wishes was granted in a roundabout way when King Philip outlawed soup. The king's men were sent out to deliver the grim news and to collect from the people of the kingdom of Dor their kettles, their spoons, and their bowls. Reader, you know exactly how and why this law came to pass, so you would not be as surprised as Uncle was when one Sunday a soldier of the king knocked on the door of the hut that Mig and Uncle and the sheep shared and announced that soup was against the law. How's that? said Uncle. By royal order of King Philip, repeated the soldier, I am sent here to tell you that soup has been outlawed in the kingdom of Dor. You will, by order of the king, never again consume soup, nor will you think of it or talk about it. And I, as one of the king's loyal servants, am here to take from you your spoons, your kettle, and your bowls. Well, that can't be, said Uncle. Nevertheless, it is. What will we eat? And what will we eat it with? Cake, suggested the soldier, with a fork. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely, said Uncle, if we could afford to eat cake? The soldier shrugged. 
I'm only doing my duty. Please hand over your spoons, your bowls, and your kettle. Uncle grabbed hold of his beard. He let go of his beard and grabbed the hair on his head. Unbelievable, he shouted. I suppose next the king will be wanting my sheep and my girl, seeing as those are the only possessions I have left. Do you own a girl? said the soldier. I do, said Uncle. A worthless one, but still she's mine. Ah, said the soldier. That, I'm afraid, is against the law too. No human may own another in the kingdom of Dor. But I'll pay for a fair and square with a good laying in and a handful of cigarettes and a blood-red tablecloth. No matter, said the soldier. It is against the law to own another. Now, you will hand over to me, if you please, your spoons, your bowls, your kettle, and your girl. Or if you choose not to hand over these things, then you will come with me to be imprisoned in the castle dungeon. Which will it be? And that is how Miggery Sow came to be sitting in a wagon full of soup-related items next to a soldier of the king. Do you have parents? said the soldier. I will return you to them. Eh? Hey, a ma? shouted the soldier. Dead, said, said Mig. Your pa? shouted the soldier. I ain't seen him since he sold me. Right, I'll take you to the castle then. Go, said Mig, looking around the wagon in confusion. You want me to paddle? To the castle, shouted the soldier. I'll take you to the castle. The castle? Where the itty bitty, itty bitty princess lives? That's right. Go, said Mig. I, I aim to be a princess too someday. That's a fine dream, said the soldier. He clucked to the horse and tapped the reins and they took off. I'm happy to be going, said Mig, putting her hand up and gently touching one of her cauliflower ears. Might just as well be happy, seeing as it doesn't make a difference to anyone but you if you are or not, said the soldier. We will take you to the castle and they will set you up fine. You will no longer be a slave. You will be a paid servant. Hey, said Mig. You'll be a servant, shouted the soldier. Not a slave. Go, said Mig, satisfied. A servant I will be, not a slave. She was 12 years old. Her mother was dead. Her father had sold her. Her uncle, who wasn't her uncle at all, had clouted her until she was almost deaf. And she wanted more than anything in the world to be a little princess wearing a golden crown and riding a high white stepping horse. A high stepping white horse. Reader, do you think it is a terrible thing to hope when there is really no reason to hope at all? Or is it, as the soldier said about happiness, something that you might just as well do, since in the end, it really makes no difference to anyone but you? Chapter 29. Start with the curtsy and finish with the thread. Mingri Sow's luck continued. On her first day on the job as a castle servant, she was sent to deliver a spool of red thread to the princess. Mind, said the head of the serving staff, a dour woman named Louise, she is royalty, so you must make sure you curtsy. How's that? shouted Mig. You must curtsy, shouted Louise. Go, said Mig. Yes, am She took the spool of thread from Louise and made her way up the golden stairs to the princess's room, talking to herself as she went. Here I am, off to see the princess. Me, Miggery Sow, seeing the princess up close and personal like. And first off, I must curse ye, because she is the royalty. At the, at the door to the princess's room, Mig had a sudden crisis of confidence. She stood a moment, clutching the spool of thread and muttering, muttering to herself. Now, how did that go? She said. Give the princess the thread and then give her a curse ye? No, first a curse ye, and then the thread. That's it. Go, oh, that's right. That's the order. Start with the curse and finish with the thread. She knocked at the princess's door. Enter, said the prin said the pea. Mig, hearing nothing, knocked again. Enter, said the pea. And Mig, still hearing nothing, knocked yet again. Maybe, she said to herself, the princess ain't to home. But then the door was flung wide, and there was the princess herself, staring right at Miggery Sow. Go, said Mig, her mouth hanging open. Hello, said the pea. Are you the new serving maid? Have you brought me my thread? Curse ye, I must. Curse ye, I must, shouted Mig. She gathered her skirt, dropped the spool of thread, stuck a foot out and stepped on the spool, rocked back and forth for what seemed like quite a long time, both to the watching princess and the rocking Mig, and finally fell to the floor with a Miggish thud. Whoopsie, said Miggery Sow. The pea could not help it. She laughed. That's all right, she said to Mig. 
shaking her head. It's the spirit of the thing that counts. How's that? shouted Mig. It's the spirit of the thing that counts, shouted P. Thank you, miss, said Mig. She got slowly to her feet. She looked at the princess. She looked down at the floor. First the cursey and then the thread, Mig muttered. Pardon, said the P. Go, said Mig. The thread. She dropped to her hands and knees to locate the spool of thread. When she found it, she stood back up and offered it to P. I brought you your thread, didn't I? Lovely, said the princess, as she took the thread from Mig. Thank you so much. I cannot seem to hold on to a spool of red thread. Everyone I have disappears somehow. Are you making a thing? asked Mig, squinting at the cloth in the pea's hand. I'm making a history of the world, my world, said the pea, in tapestry. See, here is my father, the king, and he is playing the guitar because that is something he loves to do and does quite well. And here is my mother, the queen, and she is eating soup because she loved soup. Soup? Go, that's against the law. Yes, said the princess. My father outlawed it because my mother died while she was eating it. Your ma's dead? Yes, said the pea. She died just last month. She bit her bottom lip to stop it from trembling. Ain't that the thing, said Mig. My ma is dead too. How old were you when she died? Bold was I, said Mig, taking a step back away from the princess. I'm sorry then. No, no. How old? How old were you? shouted the pea. Not but six, said Mig. I'm sorry, said the princess. She gave Mig a quick, deep look of sympathy. How old are you now? Twelve years. So am I, said the princess. We're the same age. What is your name? she shouted. Miggery. Miggery Sow, but most just calls me Mig. And I saw you once before, princess. You passed me by on a little white horse. On my birthday it was, and I was in the field with Uncle Sheep, and it was sunset time. Did I wave to you? asked the princess. Eh? Did I wave? shouted the pea. Yes, nodded Mig. But you didn't wave back, said the princess. I did, said Mig. Only you didn't see. Some day I will sit on a little white horse and wear a crown and wave. Some day, said Mig, and she put up a hand to touch her left ear. I will be a princess too. Really, said the pea, and she gave Mig another quick, deep look, but said nothing else. When Mig finally made her way back down the golden stairs, Louise was waiting for her. How long, she roared, did it take you to deliver a spool of thread to the princess? Too long, guessed Mig. That's right, said Louise, and she gave Mig a good cloak to the ear. You are not destined to be one of our star servants. That is already abundantly clear. No, ma'am, said Mig. That's all right, though, because I aim to be a princess. You, a princess, don't make me laugh. This reader was a little joke on Louise's part, and she was not a person who laughed. Ever, not even at a notion as ridiculous as Miggery Sow becoming a princess. One more chapter. Chapter 30. To the Dungeon. At the castle, for the first time in her young life, Mig had enough to eat, and eat she did. She quickly became plump, and then plumper still. She grew rounder and rounder and bigger and bigger. Only her head stayed small. Reader, as the teller of this tale, it is my duty from time to time to utter some hard and rather disagreeable truths. In the spirit of honesty, then, I must inform you that Mig was the tiniest bit lazy, and, too, she was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. That is, she was a bit slow-witted. Because of these shortcomings, Louise was hard-pressed to find a job that Miggery Sow could effectively perform. In quick succession, Mig failed as a lady-in-waiting. She was caught trying on the gown of a visiting duchess. A seamstress, she sewed the cloak of the writing master to her own frock and ruined both, and as a chambermaid. Sent to clean a room, she stood open-mouthed and delighted, admiring the gold walls and floors and tapestries, exclaiming over and over again, Go, ain't it pretty? Go, it's something, then! And did no cleaning at all. And while Mig was trying and failing at these many domestic chores, other important things were happening in the castle. The rat in the dungeon below was pacing and muttering in the darkness, waiting to take his revenge on the princess. And upstairs in the castle... The princess had met a mouse, and the mouse had fallen in love with her. Would there be consequences? You bet. Just as Mig's inability to perform any job well had its consequences. 
For finally, as a last resort, Louise sent Meg to the kitchen, where Cook had a reputation for dealing effectively with difficult help. In Cook's kitchen, Meg dropped eggshells in the pound cake batter. She scrubbed the kitchen floor with cooking oil instead of cleanser. She sneezed directly on the king's pork chop moments before it was to be served to him. Of all the good-for-nothings I have encountered, shouted Cook, surely you were the worst, the most cauliflower-eared, the good-for-nothingest. There's only one place left for you, the dungeon. Eh? said Meg, cupping a hand around her ear. You're being sent to the dungeon. You're to take the jailer his noonday meal. That will be your duty from now on. Reader, you know that the mice of the castle feared the dungeon. Must I tell you that the humans feared it too? Certainly it was never far from their thoughts. In the warm months, a foul odour rose out of its dark depths and permeated the whole of the castle. And in the still, cold nights of winter, terrible howls issued from the dark place, as if the castle itself were weeping and moaning. It's only the wind, the people of the castle assured each other. Nothing but the wind. Many a serving girl had been sent to the dungeon, bearing the jailer's meal, only to return white-faced and weeping, hands trembling, teeth chattering, insisting that they would never go back. And worse, there were whispered stories of those servant girls who had been given the job of feeding the jailer, who had gone down the stairs and into the dungeon, and who had never been seen or heard from again. Do you believe that this will be Mig's fate? Gore, I hope not. What kind of a story would this be without Mig? Listen, you cauliflower-eared fool, shouted Cook. This is what you do. You take the tray of food down to the dungeon, and you wait for the old man to eat the food, and then you bring the tray back up. Do you think that you can manage that? I reckon so, said Mig. I take the old man the tray, and he eats what's on it, and then I bring the tray back up. Empty it would be, then. I'll bring the empty tray back up from the deep downs. That's right, said Cook. Seems simple, don't it? But I'm sure you'll find a way to bungle it. Eh? said Mig. Nothing, said Cook. Good luck to you. You'll be needing it. She watched. Oh, she. <laughs> well, that's her voice now. She watched as Mig descended the dungeon stairs. They were the very same stairs, Peter. <sighs> that the mouse of Despero had been pushed down the night before. Unlike the mouse, however, Mig had a light. On the tray with the food, there was a single flickering candle to show her the way. She turned on the stairs and looked back at Cook and smiled. That cauliflower-eared, good-for-nothing fool, said Cook, shaking her head. What's to become of someone who goes into the dungeon smiling, I ask you? Reader, for the answer to Cook's question, you must read on. Or... Turn in to, tune in tomorrow, because we're going to end it there, on page 158 at chapter 31. We are already about two-thirds of the way through. I don't think we're going to finish tomorrow, because we've got rather a lot to go, but we got through another 80 pages, so probably two more days. Um, tomorrow's Saturday, but we're still going to do a read out because I feel like it. So have a good night. Stay safe, stay healthy. And I will see you tomorrow.